the, the talk today is about the Lunar Pro Polar Propellant Mining Outpost. Our presenter is Dr. Joel Sertel. He's the CTO and CEO of Trans Astronautical Corporation. Transastra is a new space company dedicated to accelerating the process of human exploration and industrialization of cislunar space and near-Earth asteroids. And so I'll hand it over to him and, and feel free to, to take it away. Thank you very much, Brian. I really appreciate it. I'm honored to be here. I pre really appreciate the invitation to speak today. Um, as Ryan said, I'm the CEO and founder of Transastra Corporation. Um, Transastra uh, is most of the work that we do is on space resource utilization. Um, harvest the, the technologies and systems to harvest and utilize the resources of space for uh, human exploration and uh, industrial development. <clears throat> now, most of the work that we do is actually focused on uh, a method of asteroid mining called optical mining, which we invented in the 2015-2016 timeframe, which is patent pending. And um, the center of optical mining, optical mining is used in our APIS architecture of um, asteroid mining vehicles, which includes um, the Mini-B tech demonstrator that we're working on building right now for NASA, the Honey Bee full-scale asteroid mining vehicle, and the Queen Bee uh, super large scale asteroid mining vehicles. Um, all of those vehicles are devoted to harvesting water and then later other materials from asteroids. And we're actually taking orders already uh, for water to sell uh, in geostationary orbit. We hope to be making an announcement of a significant order of 100 tons of water uh, to, for delivery commercially to geostationary orbit um, within the next month. That's not what I'm here to talk about today. What I'm here to talk about is um, the other area of our focus, which I'm very excited about, which we call the Lunar Polar Propellant Mining Outpost, LPMO. So LPMO, um, the funding for LPMO is coming from the NASA NIAC office, the NASA Advanced Innovative Concepts office. We completed a phase one study for them last year, and we're currently midway through a phase two technology demonstration of that. The work I'll be summarizing today really summarizes what we did in our phase one study. And uh, we're just really excited about this because we think we've cracked the nut, solved the problem of how to produce thousands of tons of propellant in the lunar polar areas uh, to support um, a large, very affordable lunar outpost for NASA and later a commercial hotel. One of the things that we didn't talk about during our phase one activity, so it's not built into the charts I'll be presenting today, is who all our partners are on this. So our corporate partners on the LPMO work include um, Blue Origin, uh, Jeff Bezos's aerospace company. Um, Blue Origin, as many people know, has recently won a very substantial contract from NASA to start building uh, a human rated lander and carrying people to the moon by 2024. And um, it's well known that Jeff Bezos uh, has publicly stated that the reason he got into the aerospace business was to build a hotel on the moon. The reason he started Amazon was to get the money to start an aerospace company to build a hotel on the moon. And so um, a lot of what we're talking about here are the technologies and systems needed to build a very affordable hotel that can grow into a village and then a city on the moon. Um, so we're really focused on mining ice on the moon. The question is, why would you want to mine ice on the moon? Uh, the answer is to enable an outpost that can, can, that can grow into a sustainable lunar city. By sustainable, we mean that it doesn't require billions of dollars of government's funds, but that it could be sustainable on the basis of private sector investment and revenue. Um, in order to make that happen, the transportation cost to get to and from the moon needs to be real low. And if you have to carry all the propellant to get home from the moon to the moon, 
it's a huge multiplier on the round trip transportation cost. Imagine if every airliner that went to Hawaii had to carry all the fuel for its return trip from Hawaii, um, you wouldn't be able to get very many passengers to and from Hawaii. Um, and it would be unaffordable to go on vacation there. Um, it, the, the situation is even more extreme with regard to the moon. Water is the ultimate propellant in space because you can electrolyze water into oxygen and hydrogen and liquefy them. And then you have LOX hydrogen propellant for the highest performing rocket engines that we have. Um, water is also a great propellant in and of itself for, with solar thermal engines or um, various different types of water thrusters, like the microwave electrothermal thrusters that Momentus is building. So how would ice mining enable a city? Well, first of all, it, it minimizes the mass needed to be transported. Most of that mass is in rocket propellant. Um, and that's a huge factor in getting to and from the moon. Second, um, you can make the oxygen that you need in air out of water, which is a huge cost savings. Um, frozen water ice is an outstanding radiation shield. The, the lunar surface is not a safe place for people to hang out. You need lots of radiation shielding, meters of shielding. Um, and as we'll see as, as we get into this, Water also helps tremendously with the electric power problem on the moon. So what are the key challenges with building an outpost on the moon? First is the ice on the moon is in dark craters that haven't seen the light of the sun for 4 billion years. And these cryogenically cold dark craters um, have the most valuable material on the moon, which is water, but they're also, in a sense, the least, ha least hospitable places on the moon. Um, the, the big barrier to lunar exploration and development has always been power. The issue is, if you're on the equator on the moon, um, you get sunlight for, for the equivalent of 14 Earth days, and then you're plunged into darkness for 14 Earth days. In other words, yep. one lunar day, yeah, so the key challenges is the key challenges for su sustainable lunar development uh, um, are power and water. And the problem with power is the long 14-day lunar night. That's if you're on the equator. If you're in the near the lunar poles, you get even less daylight. And so for this reason, a lot of people have proposed nuclear power systems for the moon. The problem with nuclear power systems is because of safety regulations, they cost at least 10 and maybe 100 times as much as solar power systems, and they weigh 10 to 100 times as much for moderate size, you know, up to a few megawatts of, of power. Um, so you really need a solution to the power problem that provides continuous affordable power. And I'm really happy to report today that we've solved that problem, and I'm going to tell you what the solution is. Now, why do you need so much power on the moon? Well, one is you need power just to run equipment and keep people alive. It's, um, it's on the order of kilowatt hours of electric power per person per day just to run environmental control and life support systems. Um, but, but more than that, um, if we're harvesting water on the moon, it's incredibly intensive, power intensive to do that. Um, for, um, a cis-lunar transportation network that's supporting a small lunar outpost, you need on the order of a thousand tons of water a year, which means you need megawatts of electric power. And um, so power, so the issue is power is really hard to get on the moon. You need a lot of power to harvest water. Um, and water is incredibly important. So you have this, this combination of problems that you're dealing with. So if you're going to address that, there's some questions you need to know the answers to. Where's the water? How can you get and store the power? If you can find the power, how can you get the water to make it useful? And then once you have all that together, how do you build and grow a city? So we've been thinking very carefully about that. Um, this is a map of the lunar polar uh, North Pole region. And as you can see, some of the craters that are well known near the lunar pole 
uh, include Whipple, Herschelwood, and Perry. Um, virtually all of the lunar ices are thought to exist near the lunar north and south pole. Um, it's a pretty um, inhospi inhospitable place. Um, <clears throat> one of my colleagues who was listed on the title page, Dr. Kevin Cannon, who's currently a postdoc at the University of Central Florida, no, no doubt he'll be a tenured professor, a tenured track professor at some highly ranked school very soon. Um, he and um, his advisor at UCF, Dr. Dan Britt, have developed um, a mathematical model of the distribution of ices on the moon called the Ice Favorability Index. What the Ice Favorability Index does is it takes into consideration the, the age of the terrain. So um, basically you can measure the age of the terrain on the moon by looking at cra crater overlays. We have a really good historical database of the history of cratering and crater bombardment in the solar system. So by looking at, you know, this crater has been hit by this crater, has been hit by this crater, you can build up a time-based map of how old every surface on the moon is. In the IFI model, if a surface hasn't been disturbed for billions of years, it gets a very high score on IFI. If it's been churned up recently, such that any water that was in there would have been tossed out, heated by subsequent impacts, it gets a lower score. And the other thing that Kevin did was he modeled where sunlight has been on the moon by looking at the wobble, tilt, and orbital precession of the moon for the last few billion years. We have topographic maps of the moon. We know how the moon is wobbled and tilted over billions of years. So we know the places where sunlight hasn't been for billions of years. And then he's correlated that to ro remote sensing data. And lo and behold, the IFI model correlates nearly perfectly with remote sensing data that says where there's hydrogen and other evidence of water on the moon. So we have very high confidence that the IFI model is a, an excellent model of where to find mo ice on the moon. As you can see, um, the ice favorability, where you see blue patches in this map, that's where there's very, very likely to be lots of ice. If it's black, there's less ice. As you see, as you get away from the lunar uh, pole, there's less ice. Now then, what Kevin did was he searched for a place on the moon where you have moderate topography with an extensive ice field. And we, he found a place, I'll be talking a little bit more about it, that's about as big as the land area around New York City, which is extremely modest and it has some other really great features that I'll be talking about. Now, so we know where the ice is very, very probably. Um, we do need missions to go and actually confirm that the ice is where the mathematical models say they are, but NASA is working really hard on that. That's happening anyway. So let me tell you about our invention to solve the problem of how to get sunlight on the moon. Here's a grossly oversimplified cartoon. Imagine that you are near the lunar pole in a place where there's ice shown as, as blue here. If you're, now, if you're near the lunar pole, let's see, I actually have a little model. This is not a model of the moon. This is actually a, um, a very small scale model of an asteroid we're using for our asteroid mining experimental program, but it's good enough for this purposes. So if you're on the moon and the moon is rotating like this, then the lunar pole is up here. Now imagine the sun is shining on you like, like this light that's hitting my little model of the moon. If you're on the equator, and you go into the dark side, as the moon rotates, you're in darkness. But if you're near the pole, and you have a tower sticking up above the pole, that tower can be perpetually in sunlight. Now, you could never consider doing such a thing to get perpetual sunlight on the Earth, because the tower would have to be many kilometers high, and you can't build towers on the Earth that are many kilometers high. But it turns out, without weather and with only one sixth the gravity in vacuum, we've actually proven that you can build towers on the moon that are high enough that the top of the tower is in perpetual sunlight in many, many areas uh, near the lunar poles, both in the North Pole and the South Pole. We call that invention the sunflower. By the way, all the inventions I'll be describing here today are patent pending. Um, 
So take this area that I showed you on the map um, that shows uh, near the crater Whipple and Herschel Wood. Now on the left, we see a, a, uh, a scale of how much illumination there is with no tower. As you can see that dark black suggests that everywhere there's ice, there's no sun. We've done, um, we've done um, really careful modeling of how the ice works or how the illumination works on the moon. On the other hand, if you're a thousand meters above the surface, you can see there are very large areas that have high ice favorability that are in nearly perpetual sunlight. So a tower takes you from nearly perpetual darkness to nearly perpetual light on the moon. Um, so um, this is illumination and this is blackout conditions. In this case, bright yellow is completely blacked out. Dark green is complete light. And you see this area between Whipple and Herschel Wood. This is an area as, as large as New York's, as the whole metropolitan New York area. And you can see that with a thousand meter tower, it's in virtual perpetual illumination. And the floor of it is virtually perpetually dark with um, extremely high ice favorability. In fact, we did some studies to figure out how tall of a tower that you need and you really only need an 800 meter tall tower. So uh, about a half a mile. You say, can't, you can't build a half mile tower on the moon. That's ridiculous. We'll get to that. Um, and so um, we found this little topological feature, which this is kind of in an elevated area near the lunar po pole that we call, we, we, sometimes we call it the NIAC Glen because the NASA NIAC program funded this work. Or sometimes we call it New Babylon. Um, what's really exciting about this is most of the places that people talk about getting ice on the moon are in craters. Craters are extremely treacherous. You cannot drive rovers down into craters. Very difficult to get power down into craters. Um, uh, the, the, the walls of craters can be unstable if you're trying to traverse them. But this glen has very moderate topography, moderate enough that you could safely land vehicles there and uh, have rovers move around conveniently. This is just showing the scale of, the, of the, the Glen that we found relative to New York City. Now the question is, 800 meter tower, I mean, think about that, that's huge. Is that really reasonable with reasonable payload fractions on the moon? So we did an engineering study of this using a technology called Tensegrity Towers. Um, if you study this chart, you'll see that um, the engineering parameters that we used for the materials, this, um, this long acronym stands for uh, ultra high molecular weight poly, I forget what the E is, polyurethane, per poly, I, I think, but it's basically um, a type of uh, polyurethane, poly, polyimide that is very high tensile strength. And then carbon bars that are just carbon composite bars like in any aerospace structure. We, so we modeled that performance. And what we found is that an 800 meter tower can be deployed out of a can in the moon and carry a third of its mass as payload on the top. So one possibility is you could put a solar panel at the top of the tower. But a better possibility is you put a very lightweight reflector at the top of the tower and reflect that sunlight down to the surface. And then you can put solar arrays on the surface of the moon and they operate just like solar arrays in one sun, but continuous 24 seven. And what we found is a single New Glenn launch vehicle, the Blue Origin New Glenn can deliver 1.5 megawatts of solar power in a single launch to the moon. So that's a very exciting uh, finding. We did engineering studies to see what that vehicle would look like. Um, it's a self landing tower. Um, that um, the vehicle lands on the moon, a tower comes out, solar arrays come out at the bottom, sunlight is reflected down, and you have a megawatt power supply with every new Glenn launch. This is at least an order of magnitude more cost effective than any other approach providing continuous electric power or near continuous electric power on the moon. So major finding in the study that we did for NASA is that you simply don't need nuclear power to have highly cost effective power rich outpost on the moon. Very exciting. Now, even with these towers, there are eclipse periods. An 800 meter tower 
requires about 100 days of eclipse a year, and it's about 97% continuous illumination. So how do you store the power on the moon? Well, with our partners at Blue Origin, Blue Origin is going to be electrolyzing the water to make um, LOX hydrogen. Our hope is that we will be Blue Origin's um, utility provider on the moon, where we sell them electric power and water, and they sell us transportation services to get to the moon. The joint customer of Blue Origin and Transaster together initially will be NASA, but later it could be um, a hotel on the moon, and then that can grow into being a city. Here's, so Blue Origin is very interested in potentially buying our water and then using it with electrolysis and refrigeration to make LOX hydrogen propellant out of it. Now here's an exciting fact. If you take their LOX hydrogen propellant plant and you just add a modest, modest fuel cell to it, you have everything for energy storage at nearly zero net cost um, uh, relative to just having the fuel production plant. So um, we consider this to be just a thrilling conclusion that we've come to is that um, by having a LOX hydrogen economy based on locally harvested water, um, we can store all the energy we need to get through any dark periods with lots of emergency reserve. Um, we don't need lithium ion batteries, which are much more massive by comparison. We certainly don't need nuclear power. So we've done all the um, engineering studies on that. And so what we've really found is that while the sunflower solar towers solve the power production problem, water in conjunction with a propellant production plant and modest fuel cells solve the energy storage problem on the moon. But how do you get the water? No one's ever mined water on the moon. So to do that, we've invented a new technical process that we call radiant gas dynamic mining. And we put it into rovers that look like beetles that we call beetle rovers. The way it works is that the beetle rovers have a dome that they carry around. And when they're trundling from one mining location to another, the dome is up so they can have ground clearance. When they get to a place where they wanna do mining, they drop the dome. And then um, we use microwave power to heat the, the frozen, some would call permafrost, others would call ice laden regolith. And we vaporize the water ice and then we capture it in our patent pending continuous flow um, vapor trap that turns, that captures the vapor as frost on a moving belt and dumps it into um, propellant water storage vessels. So the Beetle rovers are electric powered rovers. They have fuel cell energy storage on them. So they have a LOX hydrogen, they have a LOX hydrogen, um, liquid LOX hydrogen um, energy storage that they use to produce electricity for roving around. When, as they burn that LOX hydrogen, it produces water that they put into their clean water tanks. As they're mining water, they produce dirty water that goes into their dirty water tanks. When the, when the LOX hydrogen tanks are empty and the water tanks are full, they trundle back to the depot where they dump uh, their dirty water in dirty tanks and their clean water in clean, clean tanks. Then at the processing plant, the dirty water is cleaned up so that it can be converted to LOX hydrogen through electrolysis and liquefaction. So um, here's some diagrams about how that system works. Um, those of you of patents know that this looks a lot like a patent diagram. There's, that's not a coincidence. This is patent pending technology. And we're in an experimental program right now funded by NASA to prove that technology. So one Beetle Rover can deliver 100 tons of liquid, liquid water to the depot a year. And we can launch five Beetle Rovers to the moon on a single new Glenn. So we've proven through our work with NASA that radiant gas dynamic mining and the lunar and the Beetle Rovers solve the model, the water acquisition problem to the, for the moon. So um, now the downside of the Beetle Rovers is that it's low technology readiness level. So we're working hard in the lab to mature that technology. We've also designed a roadmap of what it takes to get from where we are to having a city on the moon in a series of six, what we call epochs. that start with a verification campaign, go to an initial lunar propellant storage station, which is initially robotic and then human tended, 
and propellant production campaign, habitats with rotating crews, habitat development, um, laboratory outpost, hotel, and then city. We have this video. Let's see if it plays inside Zoom. Um, so I'm going to start the video and ask you if it has sound for you. Let me know if there's sound. No, we're not hearing anything right now. Okay, let me just, I'm going to just do a little trick here to make the sound work for you. The problem is, is I've been using my Bluetooth earbuds and um, it may be that the sound will work this way. The sound is not really important for this video, but let's give it a go. Okay, no sound, that's okay. So it's a revolutionary approach. The first step is to do experimental work to verify the location of the water ice and that the beetle rovers work. So we have a one fifth scale beetle rover. It's one meter in diameter that we deploy. Once we've verified that, then we deploy our first solar power tower, our first sunflower tower. Um, this is a video of how that deployment works. It's a single landed vehicle um, that you now that um, deploys um, solar arrays. And there's a tower that erects out of that as a deployable structure. And again, as I said before, each new Glen launch can deliver about a megawatt of continuous solar power. Once you have a megawatt of continuous solar power, you're ready to deploy your fleet of four or five um, mining rovers, each of which delivers about 100 tons of ice a year. And, and the, their batteries are recharged by that solar power tower. One of the things that any outpost on the moon will need is landing pads with berms to keep foreign object damage from um, hurting astronauts and crew. Um, we've also de designed a full habitat uh, that doesn't require highly trained astronauts. It can be relatively ordinary people um, who don't have to go EVA, do spacewalks and that sort of thing. Um, this happens to be a, a lunar people mover that we've designed that can work with a, um, a lunar outpost, which is located, um, it has to be buried under regolith on the moon, so that radiation, um, long, long duration exposure on the moon is not okay from a radiation perspective. So the habitat needs to be completely covered with regolith. So here we have a subterranean, it's not subterranean so much as you build the habitat with hotel-like rooms and so on, then you cover it with regolith using the equivalent of um, earth moving equipment. So this is how we grow from a, a tech demo mission to a lunar polar propellant mining outpost to a hotel and later to a city. So, um, and we've worked the economics and logistics and it looks really promising. So just to wrap up, sunflower towers solve the power problem at high lunar latitudes Energy stored in LOX hydrogen solves the eclipse energy storage problem. Radiant gas dynamic mining beetles solve the water collection problem. And we found ideal locations on the moon for where to build an outpost. I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes if people have questions they'd like to ask. Yeah, it looks like we have a couple of questions in chat real quick. I'll run through those. Uh, so um, uh, ultra high um, molecular weight polyethylene is susceptible to UV and atomic oxygen. Do you have mass margins for a UV barrier like an aluminum film? On the moon and you cover the, you cover the strands with, um, with UV protectorant. So that's a good question though. All right, another question. Uh, won't reflecting light, uh, this light down onto the surface, start to deplete the water supplies by outgassing? Um, well, the first thing that we'll do is we'll mine the water near the reflected light. But remember, the reflected light goes down to our solar panels. Um, the other thing is, if we deplete the, the, the water just locally around the solar panels, it's going to go ca get captured mostly in the, in the cold trap where the other water is captured any, anyway. The nice thing about that is to be right on the surface where it's easier to get. Um, the, um, the temperatures inside these cold traps is, is far below the temperature that you need for long-term storage of water. And um, uh, we don't want to waste 
that sunlight by having it scatter in places we don't want it. Um, we can, however, redirect that sunlight and focus it thermally for thermal processes. Um, and that's one of the things that we've been studying. I just didn't cover it in this presentation. All right, well, we have another question here. Uh, uh, will you get funding entirely from Blue Origin or is there a potential for public-private partnership? We're, we're doing this in public-private partnership. So Transastra has its own investors. Blue Origin is not an investor in Transastra. Blue Origin is a partner. Um, in fact, Transastra, um, NASA is funding uh, Transastra and Blue Origin is a sub to us on our studies. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, we have a, a memorandum of understanding with Blue Origin, which I can say publicly. I can't tell you all the details of that mem memorandum of understanding. Um, but um, I gave you the rough thumbnail of what the partnership is all about. Okay. And then uh, another question. Uh, is the light available at lower altitudes of the moon? Lower latitudes? Oh, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, well, there's light. I, I don't understand the question. Um, the sunflower towers are specifically designed to work more effectively in polar regions, and they do work more effectively in polar regions. The power problem is more acute in polar regions. So we're solving the problem where the power problem is. Um, and there's much more that you can do with smaller sunflowers than I talked about. Um, a hundred meter sunflower um, can turn a small permanently shadowed region from having essentially zero sunlight to having a 50% solar duty cycle. So 50% solar du duty cycle means that it's equivalent to being near the equator on the moon instead of being near the poles. So that's very excited because a moderate sized solar power tower, a moderate sized sunflower tower can actually turn a lander that might have been designed for lunar equatorial operations for long life into a long life lunar polar lander. So early on, there's a lot you can do with this. Okay, let's see, um, uh, this is a question from Bill. Uh, uh, what do you do about the dispersion of sunlight uh, due to the sun not acting as a point source? And then also, uh, uh, then go ahead with that, answer that one. Yeah, first. so the sun has a divergence angle of about a half a degree. The reflector that we have on the top of the tower is essentially flat and the precision is, a significant, is about a quarter of a degree. So when the sun hits that reflector, it goes down to the surface with about a degree and about three quarters of a degree of divergence. Reflector is about 800 meters tall. So that leads to about 10 meters of divergence at the bottom of the tower but the reflector is much larger than that. It's about 30 meters in diameter. So it does tend to defocus the light a little bit. If you had a small reflector, like a one meter reflector, it would be useless at the top of the tower. But because the tower, the reflector size is large compared to the divergence of sunlight, works just fine. So let me just ask that question, or did you get the answer? Did that make sense? Yeah, I, yeah the, um, I think so. Uh, then, yeah, yes. And then okay. the, the, the second part of the question was the, how big of a mirror are you putting on top of the tower? And I think, I believe yeah, so that's all in the trade studies, but um, you can work out the numbers. If you wanted uh, a megawatt of power and you had to say, you know, 30% efficient cells, you can work all that out. A pretty simple calculation. Okay. Um, and then the reflectors uh, at the top of the tower, uh, will they heat up in the sunlight? And if so, how, how would you cool them? The reflectors in the sunlight will be at room temperature continuously because we're at one AU from the sun. And if you're at one AU from the sun, you can design something to work at room temperature. Um, the reflectors will have to rotate at um, a speed of one rotation every 28 days. So they'll be on what we call heliostats. So they have to have a, a sun tracker on them with a simple motor with the PID controller. Cool. All right. It, um, does anyone have any other questions? Um, feel free to pop them in the chat. Otherwise, let's 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 unmute everyone and just okay. let people speak. And All right. Yeah. If they want to turn on their cameras and unmute, that's great. I All prefer right. Yeah. That. All right. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free to 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 chat away, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
that was so well, that was work. a fail. That was a fail. But you won't have to do it. Work for me. Yeah. Rent house is just under 2,000 square feet. Yeah. It's a two bedroom, two bath. Okay. They're asking 32,000. Okay, let's meet everyone. Doing? That's not working. Hey, Joel, I've got a question. Okay. So one thing that I, I'm trying to get into the industry, I'm starting an MBA program and it, it's been difficult to try to find opportunities that are non-technical, non-engineering based. And all this stuff is like right up my alley. So I'm just curious if you have any um, pointers on where to look for more things uh, like this for, for targeting where I want to try to make an impact after the MBA program. Um, there's, there's jobs for every career field in the space industry. They're not just technical. Um, but keep in mind that if you're an MBA, you're not at the pointy end of the tip, the sphere. So it's like, if you wanted to work in the fishing industry, the best thing to do is to learn about fishing. There are MBAs in the fishing industry and there are lawyers in the fishing industry. If you're a lawyer, you can specialize in space law um, or fishing law, but you're not a fisherman. Um, the fundamental problems with space are technical. Um, Every startup needs a financial manager. So let's say you have a aerospace startup with a hundred engineers, they're gonna need two or three administrative types. So you just apply for jobs in those areas. Um, I don't know, does that answer the question, Ben? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I'm aware of the problem. I, I guess maybe as a follow-up to that, uh, What's kind of the best low-hanging fruit to, to look at to get the technical expertise to, to at least be able to have the intelligent conversations you need to participate in, in the industry? Well, you know, one of my interns just told me he's applying for the graduate program at the International Space University. I'd say that's a good program to go after. Um, uh, you know, there's lots of opportunities like that. You know, be curious. Um, you know, I would say an MBA with a bachelor's degree in engineering is more desirable in this industry than an MBA without a bachelor's degree in engineering. So, so feel free to link up with me on LinkedIn and message me there and I'd be happy to advise you further. Great. Thank you. All right. Anything else that folks want to talk about? B Billick, B I L L K. Yeah, it's Bill Clausen. Uh, it's. I don't know why they decided I'm Bill C, but I am. It's the way you put your name into LinkedIn, into Zoom. Ah, well, I'll go okay. correct it so at Bill, some point. So, Bill, what would you like to talk about briefly? So, briefly, this is kind of a convoluted. Um, the essential thing is I'm curious about how efficient is the ice or water collection with the dome robot we're talking about. Right. So, um, in engineering, you know, as I used to tell my students, at Caltech, whenever you use the word efficiency, you should define what you mean. Okay. Um, efficiency should always be the ratio of two numbers. It should be dimensionless and it should maximize at one, minimize at zero. Okay. Um, so, um, so let, let me clarify. So, so, so there's, different, there's different ways you measure efficiency. So one way is what percentage of the water do you get out of the regular? Another way is how much energy do you have to put in to get right. per per uh, for the theoretical energy limit of just vaporizing the water um now there's also something that's like an efficiency but it's not an efficiency is what's the energy cost of mining the water okay, okay. so given that we're on the moon and there's uh i assume that the, the energy issue is uh less important Assume you have lots of time and lots of energy. That my real question is, uh, what what efficiency do you have in terms of uh, water recovery from yeah, the so, so regolith? We're doing, yeah. So and, and how much do you lose when you move your dome and it's still warm and it's still outgassed? Well, I think you you don't move the dome until you've captured all the water underneath it. So okay. it's a, you stop, you drop the dome, you mine the water, 
and you keep mining it until you, you're not getting any more. Then you right. lift the dome, move to the next spot, and so on. Okay. And so I mean, we've made some engineering estimates of what those efficiencies are, right. but um, we really don't know the answer to that, and that's why we're doing our experimental uh, study. Okay. So come back in a year, and I'll give you a better answer. Okay. But, I, but, but our preliminary calculations suggest it should be pretty efficient. Okay. All right. I was just wondering, is there going to be a water loss, though, once you... Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. so there's losses in everything. There'll be vapor that goes out around the dome edges. Mm -hmm. There'll be vapor that's left in the box, you know, that's left there. Um, there'll be and there'll be vapor that's a, that escapes to space. Not much vapor will escape to space. If it goes around the dome edges, it'll be re-trapped in the surrounding cold cold trap. Okay. Um, some of the water vapor will actually be frozen into regolith at deeper layers that we won't get access to. So right. we, we're working hard on that question, and that's, that's the key question that keeps me up at night. Okay. Cool. I was wondering about those kind of things. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Who else has got something they'd like to talk about? Hi, Connections Live. Yeah, uh, Doug Plata with Space Development Network. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, if you would uh, compare your approach to the Colorado School of Mines um, approach in which they had they placed mirrors up on ridges and and then redirected down to um, sure the, the guy who first came up with the idea of putting mirrors on ridges was a Adrian Stoika at JPL who won a NIAC for that did a phase two study I think it was called transformers what uh, George Sauer and um, on hell uh, did at um, Colorado School of Mines is then look at, can we take that light and put it right on the surface under like a tent dome and capture the, the water vapor that way? Um, I think it's a really nice, promising approach. Um, you know, th they won a NIAC phase one when we did, and then we competed with them to win the phase two, and we won. So there was something about our work which seemed more promising to NASA. Uh, but I think that their work is very promising, and those are very talented people. Everything I see coming out of George and on hell is terrific. Thanks. Anyone else? If you'd like to ask a question, just unmute and ask. Okay, looks like we're done. Well, um, I hope you guys enjoyed the talk. I hope you found it useful. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank so, you, Joel. That was fantastic. That was really cool. So, ciao. Well, great. Bye-bye.